Hello, and welcome to the first lab debate of the Massachusetts gubernatorial election. I'm Joanna Weiss. I, hi, this is E.J. Graff. I'm a columnist with the Boston Globe. I'm on that. <laughs> <laughs> we are here with the five Democratic candidates for governor of Massachusetts. They've been busy rounding up delegates to this weekend's caucuses, but today they revved up the four-wheel drive and they made their way into the Or Boston their drivers did. Or their drivers yeah. did. <laughs> and they made their way into the Boston Globe Media Lab to join us. So let's, uh, let's introduce them. Um, I, I should say who I actually am. You should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a senior fellow at the Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism. And now, where do we have our drum roll? Can you do that? All right, drum roll. Um, we have over to my left, Donald Berwick. Uh, former administrator of the U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We have someone I'm sure none of you know, Attorney General Martha Coakley, a uh, slightly familiar face. We have Joe Avalone, a senior vice president at a global biopharmaceutical research company. We have Juliet Kayem, former assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And also a former Globe colonist, so welcome back to the building, Juliet. Thank you. And we have Donald, uh, no. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> uh, We have, uh, <laughs> we have two Don Berwick. We have State Treasurer Steve Grossman. So as anyone who has watched our last lab debates knows, uh, we're a casual operation here. We're on a first name basis. We have Speak banned. Speak for yourself. We have banned neckties, Ms. Graf, <laughs> of any kind. Um, in the car. And we've encouraged the candidates to uh, interrupt each other politely, to ask questions of each other. We'll try to keep things fast, and we'll try to keep things moving. We sometimes ask about cage fighting, but we don't do it here. We're uh -huh. not civil. Uh, so with that, I'm going to throw it to you, EJ, for the first question. Every Democrat in the universe, um, it might be one on Mars who's different. Every Democrat in the universe is in favor of expanding early education. Last year, Governor Patrick introduced a very ambitious plan to do the same. It went nowhere. Why and what are you going to do differently? Don? Well, we have to fight for it. I'm a pediatrician. I know what it's like to have a four-year-old not ready for school. That's a kid headed for low self-esteem and for failure. We've got to make the case to the people of the Commonwealth that this is just smart investment and compassionate public management. Uh, uh, universal preschool should be, it should be available to absolutely everybody. I, I actually think that it's just the beginning. There are a lot of things we need to do, including that, because we have, depending on who you listen to, between 25,000, 40,000 kids who are waiting to go to a preschool program. If we are really going to transform our education into something that will allow our kids to compete, not only against other states, but in a global economy, we have to make sure that they have pre-K, that they have an expanded school day, they get the appropriate STEM education, and we need to invest in it with How? our cities and towns. How are you going to make it happen? Well, I, I think we decide we want to make it happen, as we did with healthcare and other things we've done here in Massachusetts. We see uh, growth in our economy in the last quarter of 5.5%. We look at economies. We set our priorities straight. We work with our cities and towns. It, it's got to be something government invests in. And do you find money for it? Joe Avalone. Yeah, I have a plan to uh, close the achievement gap. That's my highest priority. And in that plan, which is published and is paid for, uh, I do uh, fund pre-K for the at-risk schools and certainly the failing schools, along with some other things like lengthening the school day. My plan is to establish a fund in the legislature. It'll be a dedicated fund for this purpose because it's my highest priority, and I'm going to fund it by lowering our health care costs. We have massive health care costs. It's 40 percent of the state budget. Uh, I'm the only person that's controlled health care costs here. I'll do so as governor. That will create room to invest in education. Julia? I, I actually will push back a little bit on your premise. It, it, nothing, it, it's not true that nothing happened. Uh, seats were made available, and then this year again, more seats are made available. So there's not going to be a complete victory at the moment, you know, oh, I want universal, as a governor, I want universal pre-K, uh, and all the seats are going to open up. And so as a governor, you just have to keep pushing and keep opening up more seats and, and convince people uh, that we are at a competitive disadvantage to other states, which ultimately it's going to affect us economically. I, I have three kids that entered public school. That gap that you can see in pre-K between those who had uh, sort of a pre-K, uh, uh, three hours a day even, right, a pre-K opportunity uh, and those that didn't is a gap that exists in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, right? So, so we know it's our, but, but let's not think that the failure to do universal uh, means that we're not moving forward. We'll continue to. We can look at uh, private sector uh, programs we can uh, look at family programs which help a lot uh, and then we and then we steer the budget which is a which is a reflection of our morals 
Okay, about 75 to 78,000 children are born every year in Massachusetts. We've got, as Martha said, about 25,000 kids on a waiting list. The legislature did put $15 million aside in the 14 budget, and there's another $15 million in this year's budget. But every year, if you set aside enough money for 1,700 kids, that's 23,300 kids who are left out, left behind. Oklahoma said, we want to do this, and they did it in 1998. Georgia did it. We say we're number one in education, and we're leaving behind 23,000 kids every single year. So you asked a question, how are you going to pay for it? Seems to me there's only four ways to pay for your priorities. You judge a society by what? By how it spends its resources. So you can pay for our priorities by growing the economy, by public-private partnerships, by saving money, or you can do it using additional revenue. And I've said during this campaign, and I'll say it right again, maybe my colleagues want to respond. I'm not going to rule out seeking additional revenue, but I would insist if we seek additional revenue that it's got to be accompanied by meaningful tax reform to hold harmless people who are low and middle income earning up to $60,000. That to me is how a society funds its most cherished priorities. Education is just one example of where we've just got to be make new investments in this commonwealth. Any candidate for governor is going to have to say that we're going to have to find the revenue to do this. We can do it through improving health care. We have high levels of waste on our health care system, big administrative costs. That's why I'll support single payer in this state. We need to close tax loopholes and exemptions, which have grown enormously, and I would reset to zero and keep the ones back that add jobs or provide help to the safety net. And we need to have a fair tax system here. We need to have a way to have people at the bottom of the income spectrum be able to pay lower rates of tax and people at the higher end of income pay higher tax rates. Quick show of hands. I know a couple of you want to chime in, chime in but um, how many of you would support an increased tax, pursuing an increased tax for early, early education child care? I will support the it first on, place a, I go. On, okay. a, on a fair basis I don't in think which I agree people with higher Joe. income yeah. That's the first place you go, Martha Copley. No, it's, it's not, not the first not place, the place I go. Should go. No, 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 not the first place you go. Give, no, picking up on what Joe said, for every 1% we save in our medical costs here for government, we save $100 million. Uh, and Don mentioned this too. We have waste and fraud, never mind alignment of priorities that we can do much better in looking at how we invest. We've seen a 5.5% increase in the economy just in the last quarter. Uh, and so we need to do these things and we have to look first at what the priorities are, how we save money in the state, and then we'll have to look at what we do. And I think one sure. area that we should look at is, uh, is criminal justice issues. Uh, a billion dollars is anticipated Agreed. to be spent uh, by 2020, but this is a Mass Inc. bipartisan report by 2020 on prison construction. Uh, our prison population is increasing five to six percent over the course of that time. We have a system that is not progressive by any stretch of the imagination, and it is eating us alive. I mean, in terms of uh, the number of people we put in for nonviolent offenses, the the sort of what happens in the correction system, and then our recidivism is 50%, depending on what numbers you look at. So if you want to look at big ticket items and where we are behind other states and we have not reformed our criminal justice system, that is an area where you can find big bucks and it takes a governor uh, to push it through uh, because otherwise it won't get done in the state. Wait, wait, and if I we I put just, kids I, in pre-K, they won't end up in our criminal Which is justice that system. Don raised his hand on in a tax increase for early education. Right. And Steve did not, even though you were the one who raised it. No, what I said is I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah, it and I, but I would, if we use additional revenue, and I would not rule it out, I would insist that it be accompanied by a meaningful tax reform. Okay. We've got to make our tax company not Can I just say something on that? In no, that in this that Joe, well, yeah, sorry. I'd like to come back on uh, taxes. I, as Democrats, I don't think we can go to, the, to our citizens and our taxpayers with a $36 million budget and say, everything's fine here, and we want to raise taxes because there's some other things we want to do. It's not necessary. I think we're in an extraordinary time when we have 40% of our state budget tied up with health care costs. It's also the biggest, budge biggest budget buster in every city and town, and we all know it's squeezing our businesses and our families. We don't have to have it that way. Uh, there is $29 billion in waste in our system that's not in health care system, not delivering uh, improvements, which is quoted, which is uh, the report from our own health policy commission that has measured it literally for the first time. So relatively minor savings, create huge amounts of room to invest in things that we should be. And uh, I, as governor, will do that. I did control our health care costs when I was the COO of Blue Cross back in the 90s. I'll do it again as governor. And that's what we have to do. That's what we have to go back to our taxpayers okay, and citizens Okay, but for. Wait, wait a minute. We, we had a groundbreaking law just, was it last year? Uh, yeah, chapter 224. Uh, we, ha we had a groundbreaking law that's supposed to be bringing down the health care costs that, as far as I can tell, nobody knows about. Yeah. So is that is that 
not, do you think that's not the right approach? It's, yeah. it's cutting no. the cost it's curve. It's, it's you know, it was eight to 10% a year that this was increasing. It's why we started in the AG's office looking at this market and how dysfunctional it was. That is starting to bring down the rate at which that goes up. And so every time we do that, we get it and we look to changing to, uh, instead of fee-for-service, more preventative care, mm -hmm. cutting diabetes. And if we get more kids in pre-K, we yeah. will save money right. on a criminal justice system because we'll have kids who stay in school, who get educated, who can compete by third grade in high school. That's where the investment has to be. We definitely have to change health care. It's where the most expensive part of the nation. And But the law you're referring to, it, it's basically voluntary. We're going to need some more teeth and be able to help the health care system move toward uh, coordination and lower costs by raising quality. And remember, the simplification we would achieve with single payer care is massive. I ran Medicare and my overhead rate was 1%. Insurance companies are arguing that an overhead rate of 15%, which is allowed by the Affordable Care Act, is too low for them. There's a big margin in there in simplification. Yeah, yeah, really uh, yes. Can I, can I, I would say like something add. on this yeah, on yeah, single absolutely. payer? Uh, so Don says he's the only person who's put single payer on the table. I think all of us, you know, know that single payer could work, but let's just be clear and, and no, talk uh, about what's I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not that. <laughs> so so but let's just be clear. Uh, single payer will be a huge fight for this state that has ninety-eight percent. Uh, coverage. Yep. So you, a governor has to pick your fights, right? And let's just say we are now going against potentially one of us, Charlie Baker, who's making a suggestion out there, although it's hard to tell, that he wants the state completely out of the ACA. So I don't think it's fair to say that uh, that single payer is going to be the solution because it's incumbent on Democrats not only to have good ideas, but to figure out how we would implement them. I so like the that. next good idea is lowering costs, which we all know, and focusing oh. on public health. I mean, through the commission transparency litigation, and then also focusing on public health. In this nation, we have a million kids going into emergency rooms based on drugs and alcohol alone. If you could cut that by 15%, the burden uh, will, will relieve our healthcare system. You can think about it across the board. It is not a fight I'll run from. The amount of money no, no, to no, be Don, saved. No, no, you already answered. Steve, yeah. do you want to <laughs> get in? <laughs> No, I mean, the Chapter 224 you mentioned has some really important investments in it. Um, significant amount of money, more than $100 million for struggling community hospitals. If you want your community hospitals to continue to be viable, mm -hmm. so we don't have just a few major systems in the state, then you've got to invest in those. If you want healthcare technology to be implemented statewide, you've got to invest in that. So if you want so your is community- is the law enough, or does it need more time? No, I'm I simply- can respond to that. My here, here's, here's the point <laughs> I was trying to make. <laughs> It's fine to suggest that we are going to save money by implementing health care reform. But if you truly believe that universal pre-K and start with four-year-olds is something that you want to implement over the next year or two, mm -hmm. I would challenge everybody in this panel to find the money overnight in year one of your right. administration to save enough money to pay for that. So the question is, if you can't save it overnight because it'll take a number of years to implement these new approaches to saving money in health care, then how are you going to find the money to do that? And I, that's why I said I would not rule out revenue, and if you go with revenue, you've got to make it progressive. You've got to okay, make it fair. Right, that, that was my point. So I think uh, anybody, including I know Don, uh, knows that what we have to do is change the way we actually deliver care. It's not the insurance mechanism on top of it that's driving up the cost. Those costs are going up in the public programs as well. It's how the actual fragmentation of care occurs today. It's very uncoordinated. We all know referring people to doctors and then on to other doctors, repeating the tests and all that, that's wildly expensive. That's where the $29 billion came from. As we move our, our healthcare system towards what are called organized systems, doctors operating in teams to take care of the whole patient, uh, and uh, move away from fee-for-service where you're paying for volume instead of the quality of the outcomes. We do those two things, we get to a place where it's much more stable and affordable and better how outcomes. It also that's means we can pay for mental that. and behavioral health. Exactly. You can improve, uh, improve mental and behavioral health and bring it into the same system. These, this is where it has to go. It's not tinkering around the edges. The law, the first law, mm -hmm. always anticipated two steps. There was always the first step of getting everybody insured and then the second step, which is changing the delivery system. That's where we have to go now. Not and, uh, and is the law not adequate? Are you saying, I, I no? can't tell if you're saying. I think the law has uh, good teeth in it. It, it collects the data. It requires requires action plans uh, for those institutions that are above averages to bring them back to the state targets. And it ultimately requires uh, being accredited in order to take on 
new contracts that manage populations of patients. That's a lot in the law, and I think we can work with that. Sure. It takes leadership, though. Don Berwick, last, last uh, thought, and then we'll move on. I agree with Joe that you need to have uh, a change in the delivery system. You need a spokesperson for the people getting the care on their behalf to change the delivery system. Running Medicare, essentially a single payer, I was able to do that, represent 100 million people in Medicare and Medicaid. Having, having a single payer system in this state would allow us to stand behind the people. We'd have Medicare for all, effectively, in the state. So which is it, Don? You're putting it on the table, or you're coming out today and saying, I will implement single payer as quickly as I possibly can? Which is it? Because you've said both. As you've seen in my response to the questionnaire, uh, Steve, I'm in favor of it. I well, want to push it. We have to figure out how to do it. Your well, response I, I, has been equivocal. No, I saw what was on your website, and you said all through the debates we've had so far, I'm the only candidate who's put single payer on the table. Check I the challenge that. Julia challenged that. We've all put it on the table. We're going to work with Governor No, we Sean haven't all put it on the table. <laughs> <laughs> are not you, uh, Steve, are right. not on the table? The table. I'm, I'm right, confused. So okay, to make it on the clear, he's not on the table. <laughs> That's just joke. Black, right? On the progressive mass Joel questionnaire, I've, I've said yes. Are you, are you saying yes? No, I said I would put it on the table and I would study. So I want it, and you haven't declared a position okay, yet. Okay, well, so you ought to clarify your website, make it consistent. There it is, single question. pair. It's right there yeah. on the, that table. This we're is gonna a debate know, we're that gonna we, move on. we shouldn't have this debate anymore, Messrs. We have a system that works. Ninety-eight percent of people Thank are insured. You, We've already got the result. All what right. we need to do now is make it affordable. Yes. All right. We're going to move on back to education. Uh, just to, for to get to K through twelve, this is a subject that's a little near and dear to my heart because I have a fourth grader who's into her second. You should stare down the barrel at MCAS again. Um, you know, I've I've seen now MCAS, PARC is coming up, that's the new test that's aligned to the Common Core. I have seen schools and the way schools react to these tests, even, in, even if you believe in accountability, you see schools, particularly in the suburbs but not always, where the kids are really in no danger of failing the test and yet the classroom is oriented toward the test for so long the kids are freaking out. We were talking about they this. Have like kids freak out. Yeah. They have uh, nightmares. The schools are freaking out. As a governor, do you support these standardized tests? And if you do, how do you convince schools to handle them correctly? I, I. Uh, we started yes. with you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> 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 we're going to move on. Uh, I may be Martha, the only person. Sure. I think we've headed down the wrong direction in the sense that we are teaching kids to a test, learn stuff, spit it back, and it has affected how people think they are being measured. And if a kid doesn't do well on those tests, he or she is immediately out, right? They're not doing well. Uh, our whole education system should be based upon making sure every child can do as well as he or she could. I'm all in favor of accountability, but it's also why I think we need a longer and more structured school day. So the kids have a chance to learn what they need to for the accountability piece, but also that they have arts and they have recess and they have a chance to do their homework and they have a chance with their teachers to work on learning how to learn so that they're gonna be able to take the next step, whether they're going to a voc tech school or a four year college, they are not worried about this test and what I have to do on this test. Okay, but this is a how question, yeah. right? That's the goal. How are you going to convince schools to do it that way? Well, I think schools to. know that they th would rather do it. I don't think the schools will need much convincing. I, I have a plan uh, for education, K through 12. It's been published and has two goals. Uh, close the achievement gap, the highest priority, and also to uh, make everyone college and career ready. The testing has served a role, uh, but teaching the test, of course, is not good. And uh, we need to have a more holistic uh, approach now, beyond testing, just testing, uh, to measure how students learn and what they're learning. We can do that. I mean, uh, oh. you don't. Do you, yeah, do you change oh. the structure of the test? Do you say not no, as many? No, you go beyond the test. I think you include evaluations from uh, teachers as well. And obviously, teachers are at the center of this. They're the everyday heroes that are doing this. They know these kids the best. Uh, and it's just like uh, I run a large company. You know, we have to, uh, I have about 11,000 employees. I don't, I don't give them a test every year to determine how they're doing. Uh, we have evaluation systems. We can, we can use more uh, holistic evaluation systems in our schools. We absolutely can do it. These teachers are professionals. They can be brought into the process more, and I think they should be. Oh. So, so my, uh, well, uh, my poor middle child, uh, it has to do both because we're in a transition year, the MCAS and the park. So uh, the tyranny is strong in our household. Let me, let me tell you, uh, uh, honestly, uh, there's too much money uh, tied uh, to put the new park system with the race to the top to, for any governor to say, oh, I don't like evaluate any gubernatorial candidate. It's a lot of money that supports our children, and there's an assessment tied to it. Uh, I'm more optimistic than the park than it sounds like others may be just because it has been reformed to be a little bit more creative, more technologically based. 
Uh, and it's done in a way that I think is very helpful when you talk to my principal, my kid's principal, uh, that it's a way to sort of see is a, is a classroom failing in a school so that the, t the principal can get involved in a way to sort of assess what's going on in individual classrooms, but certainly not for either individual students or for teachers, right? That's what we have to remember. Other evaluations can uh, take place that sort of assess a teacher, and you don't assess the teachers until you give them the training that they need for the kind of education that is gonna benefit all of our kids, which is one that is uh, more creative, more technologically based, and one that you know g gives them the freedom they need given the range of children that are entering our public schools. So 20 years ago, we made a decision in Massachusetts. We decided to make a massive investment in public education. 20 years ago, foundation budgets. We've spent billions of dollars every year to do that. And it has had a dramatic impact on educational attainment. Now some would say they're only learning to the test and it's not creating the whole child, it's not a holistic approach. But I think this is, a, this, I think this is settled law. I think we have come to the conclusion that if you're number one in public education in the United States, and we can always do better, <laughs> and if we were competing for $250 million of federal money, for uh, improving our educational system, that PARC is the next step to MCAS. Uh, one of my concerns about PARC is that we're not technologically ready to do this right. I've said I want to make every public school in Massachusetts digital learning ready by 2016 because, frankly, many of our schools are not technologically in a place where they can do this and do this right. So, of course, we have to make sure that young people who aren't able to learn well because they have learning challenges or learning disabilities, special education. We've got to take those children into account. But fundamentally, I will rest on the fact that over 20 years we have improved dramatically the quality of public education. It's about high standards and accountability, and I as governor want to maintain those high standards and accountability, improve the system, but those are the two fundamental principles. We still yeah. have a huge <laughs> achievement gap because we have some schools that do very well yeah. and some that are way down. Well, look, less, yeah, please, can I now? <laughs> no, this is about teachers. Teachers are not the problem. They are the solution. Investing in teacher workforce, as any executive knows, and I've been an executive for 30 years, you invest in the workforce, you help them with their pride, their joy, their growth. That's where we need to go. I've seen a great example of this in Lowell, the Merkland School, level four school, a failing school. The union and the super superintendent got together. They invested in the, in the growth of teacher development, gave them opportunities for growth. Level four to level one in 18 months. There's a lesson in that. It's not about standardization only. Real quick follow-up um, for all of you. Yes or no, uh, should Massachusetts join the Common Core? Uh, we already have. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, we're there. Yeah, don't. I mean, don't don't fight it. I mean, uh, uh, let's just be totally honest. <laughs> we're actually playing There's a, a lot of role. federal right. dollars attached. So let's work around it to give who kids are the longer no. it's, it, it's a platform, but we got to remember arts and ethics and citizenship all matter for kids. we got to turn the schools over to teachers and let them lead the way they want to lead. But I think it's instructive that Common Core is one in which Massachusetts is playing a disproportionately significant role out of a reflection and out of respect to what we've been able to achieve over the past 20 years here in this Commonwealth. Yeah, I reject the idea that it's dumbing down to the rest of the country. I don't think that's accurate, and I do think the Common Core is good for us. Okay, so let's talk transportation. We've taken care of the children. We've taken <laughs> care of our health. How do we get around in this state? And many governors... Uh, Four-wheel like drive today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, talk about expanding rail service to cities like New Bedford, and I'm going to add Springfield. Um, it does not happen. Even though Massachusetts has plenty of old rail beds uh, that would be easily adapted, but there's competition for those rail beds from the people who want to change them to bike trails. Uh, another fabulous transportation alternative. So what's more important to the future of the state? <laughs> Trains, bikes, or canals? Sorry. <laughs> Canals. <laughs> I tossed that one in. Which century? <laughs> uh, let's start with Joe. Oh, yes. Uh, we have huge infrastructure uh, transportation needs in the state. Uh, uh, we're behind because of the massive overruns of the Big Dig. Thank you, Charlie Baker and the Weld Administration and others that came before. Uh, we do have to invest in it, and we need a dedicated revenue source. My uh, belief is that the South Coast Rail is absolutely imperative. I think we have to connect the South Coast to the rest of the state, certainly through Greater Boston in order to bring that region back, and that has to be a big focus of the next uh, governor is bringing a lot of our older urban uh, centers back. South Coast Rail is imperative. Not only does it allow people to come to Boston for middle class jobs, but it creates new industries in the region that have to be connected to the rest of the state. So I believe that we will need more dedicated revenue. We've started with the gas tax. We'll probably need to continue on in order to afford the things that we need to do 
but certainly part of it's rail. South Coast rail is probably high among them. But we do have a dedicated rail. That's how he interrupts me all the time. No, I'm joking. Uh, uh, no, that's fine. Listen, uh, when we talk about in infrastructure and transportation, uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about mobility. Uh, and mobility is what is going uh, is gonna to help in almost all issues that we have today, income inequality, education, kids' access to jobs. Uh, and so we have to invest in it. Dedicated streams are absolutely right. Public-private partnerships are absolutely right. When you go out and you talk to gateway mayors, you know, gateway city mayors, it is about the ability to move people around from job, school, uh, to home, right? And it is about the regional transportation authorities. When I think, if I were governor, about this state as a globally competitive state, I don't think about the trains or the rails, I think about the ports. Uh, the ports are our access to a global maritime community that we should be in a fight for. Uh, Massport anticipates 20,000 new jobs in the next 15 years if we can just even just sort of, ex not even dredge, just sort of begin to expand uh, the ship beds. Uh, it's exciting for this state and we have to invest in what we're good at in Massachusetts, uh, which is one of, the, one of the areas is our ports. Juliet, if you can't, uh, you can't get the stuff out of the ports if you don't have trains. That's right, no, 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 I, I, no but I've said that, I've said that before. Look, we, Bo whether it's New Bedford or Boston uh, or Gloucester, uh, but let's look at Boston. We don't have a rail, we're quite unique in this regard and not in a good way. We do not have a rail uh, to our major port. So what happens is if you're a shipping company, right, you think you come in uh, and you think you gotta get it on a truck, the truck then has to go to rail. Well, that's a lot of cost. And then you look at Baltimore. Baltimore makes it a lot easier. Uh, and so we have to think of ourselves in competition with other states as well for a global economy. So it's transportation infrastructure are, are, are about our experiences as citizens, but it's also about Massachusetts as a magnet uh, for a very exciting uh, you know, global economy that we, can, that we can grab. So I think of three things. I think of jobs, of economic growth, and look at Worcester. Perfect example. You mentioned Springfield. Back and forth to Worcester every day go something on the order of 20 trains. We've seen, seen thousands of jobs created in Worcester over the past 10 years. Big investments in Worcester and in public transportation. That is an indication of if we do that all over the Commonwealth and leave no region of the state behind, how it can spur economic growth and job creation. Second of all, this gives us a fabulous opportunity to significantly reduce our carbon footprint. Getting people out of the cars into public transportation using far less carbon fuel, and it's a quality of life issue. This is a dramatic opportunity, and we do have a revenue stream. The House of Representatives just passed, I believe unanimously, a $12.7 billion authorization bill which covers all the transportation needs that are in the governor's plan. I agree with the governor. I think the governor's plan is dead on, and if we couple the rebuilding of South Station, Green Line out to Somerville and Medford, Springfield, South Coast Rail, Rebuild those old rail cars that's got to be replaced, deferred maintenance, and a variety of other things, regional transit authorities. We can make this state the kind of magnet for business growth and economic development. Businesses will not come here to grow unless they think we're serious. They won't stay here if we're serious. I've spent all my life creating jobs all over the state, and I know that first-rate transportation is the key to making sure that we continue to grow and be a winner I'd in like this innovation to economy. Yeah, well, the South Coast has been waiting 30 years for rail. It's time. We need to do this. I think we agree on that. Uh, this is a, as you know, a regional equity. It's statewide. We need to make sure that's both north-south and east-west transit. And it, it is the way to invest in jobs for the future. I was in Assembly Square the other day just visiting there. 20,000 jobs are going to be added to the Somerville economy, and it wouldn't have happened if the T-stop hadn't come there. Transportation and job growth and closing economic inequality gaps uh, is I, they're all connected. We've got to invest. But I would just say, to say it's all taken care of by the uh, by a $12 billion bond bill is like saying we just put it on the credit card, which is what that is. Uh, ultimately, we have to have a revenue stream that'll pay it uh, and pay it down, and, and we will have that. Um, I'm glad Steve brought up Worcester because the mayor just endorsed me there yesterday. <laughs> and did he? And he endorsed me there Joe, yesterday. Did he? No, on a train. Did he endorse you on a train? That. We stood in a bakery, in fact. It wasn't on a train. But the reason he did that was because he knows that my approach to creating jobs is what's going to bring Worcester all the way back, and it has been making some nice uh, progress there in recent years. So <laughs> we've ignored um, both maintaining and investing in infrastructure. We had some good reasons with the economy, the way it's been. Um, I support South Coast Rail, but if you talk to folks, it's not just South Coast Rail they need. Um, there's a burgeoning business in the harbor there that involves fruit coming in, that involves trucks. So we've built a lot of roads. We need to keep our roads and bridges uh, intact. We haven't really done that as well as we should. But we also have a situation, particularly in eastern Massachusetts, we have a very dense innovation district, Cambridge. We need to get people around and out. And so that mm -hmm. involves looking at planning, 
in an urban sense, how we're going to do that transportation for people to get to their jobs, from their jobs, and then how do they get out? We're getting direct flights from China and other places around the world, which is great, but we need serious investment in maintaining what we have now, but planning, I think, regionally how those investments will work to move people, as everybody here has said, uh, and how we can expand in the next five, can ten I, years. Can I just add to that? Because you did ask about biking. So the obligation of the next governor, uh, if you want to take climate change seriously, which, you know, I come from Homeland Security, so I think about issues as risk reduction. What is What are these big risks that we're facing? And regional planning to deal with climate change adaptation is a key part of... Uh, of, of my climate change platform, but we cannot do that. We cannot get individuals to change their behavior unless transportation is working in an efficient manner. So if, you, if you're gonna add 50,000 people onto the green line, it cannot handle that now. So, so it's not an either or, as you put it, it is literally we have got to get transporta public transportation right, otherwise people's individual behavior will not change. Plus what about canals? canals? Okay. <laughs> canals, anybody? Plus I canals. missed that one. Perfect. All right, uh, we're moving on. We're going to take a break from long form answers and move on to our favorite thing, the lightning round. Oh. Uh, some candidates in past debates have had a little trouble following directions on this, so we'll see how you guys do. We're looking for one word, or in some cases, one number answers. Uh, first one, uh, should the casino law be repealed? No. Oh. <laughs> Me first? Go first. Yes. I've said no personally, but people get to one. vote. No, though I don't like casinos. So everyone's cheating. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you. And should Massachusetts legalize happy hour? Um, I, I think it's... One word. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Home rule. Yes. <laughs> no. Okay, right. we'll start with Martha this time. Uh, one more alcohol question. Should towns be able to set the number of liquor licenses they have? Uh, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> they, they should be able to do more than they do. I, I believe we should expand the cap on that. Yes. 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 No. Yes, I believe so. So I've been a selectman, Steve. I can uh, tell uh, you uh, that, that, that. Lightning <laughs> round. Okay. And, um, all right, we're going we're gonna to go backwards this time. Okay. Start with you, Steve. Uh, what should can we go the to two words, maybe? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is a number question. What should the state's minimum wage be here in Massachusetts? Eleven dollars an hour. Uh, above ten twenty. Eleven an hour. Eleven an hour. Eleven dollars an hour. Eleven and then go up. Okay, um, and we'll we'll do the same order. Should there be a separate minimum wage for teens? No, I'm comfortable. Eleven dollars an hour for everyone. Uh, n no. Yeah, no. I mean, in other words, your question <laughs> was <laughs> no, no. No, there should not be separate. No study for the future. No. No. Okay, a lot of. Differences there. <laughs> um, okay, uh, now starting with Joe, moving around this way. Uh, what's your favorite Philip Seymour Hoffman movie? Ah. Oh, jeez. Using a bunch of good ones too, and now I'm blanking. Um, okay, well you can, we can Juliet, right. and yeah. we can come back to you. Uh, wait, what's the one? Now I'm blanking too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the problem of dying so the way he has is that yeah. you actually can't you can't get past that moment. So uh, the question. Um, I'll I'll save for the next governor's race. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone recall a Philip Seymour Hoffman movie? <laughs> Capote. Give us ten. Capote. 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 Yeah. We got Capote. Yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. The one he got the Oscar. Yeah. Capote. Yeah. Did he win for the Oscar? Okay, we'll start with Martha on this one. Um, Massachusetts state song: Roadrunner or Dream On. To uh, what it is now, you mean? What, what, should, what it should be? We have There's two no proposals. Have Someone's going to have to sign a bill. Oh, Sh Dream On. Okay. Yeah, dream on. I mean, yes. I mean, Joanna, this is a question. <laughs> <laughs> dream on. Dream on. Roadrunner. Yes. Ah. <laughs> I will dream. <laughs> Sorry, we've loaded the stack here. <laughs> should we, uh, let's see, s again, starting from Steve moving this way, um, should we repeal the sales tax, ex tax exemption for candy and soda? Should we repeal the candy? Should they have the sales exemption. tax? Should there be sales tax? Let's ask it this way. Should we impose sales tax on candy and soda? Yes. Yes. Yes, public health. No. Yes, we should. Mm. Should we repeal? This is going to be another one of those double negative questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, should we have a three strikes law? Which we do. Absolutely not. 
No. 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 Um, starting here. Me. Should Jahar Zarnav face the death penalty? Death penalty has no place in our jurisprudence. I do not believe in the death penalty. But not, not the question. Should he face the death penalty? No. 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 We'll go back this way. Should South Station be renamed for Michael Dukakis? <laughs> not if he doesn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. I, I, I'm gonna, uh, yes. He's too polite. Yes. <laughs> I agree with Steve. If he if he wants it, great. If he doesn't, I would force it on him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, that way. Was Deval Patrick right to order the lockdown during the hunt for Sarnayev? Yes. 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 And uh, last, most important question. <laughs> If you are a governor during future snow emergencies, <laughs> will you wear one of those fleece MIFA vests? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who wants to chime yes, in? Yes, uh, vest and jeans, I promised. I have my own pink fleece vest. I'm ready to go. <laughs> this is my bunker uni right here. I wore it today. <laughs> <laughs> I have an old one from my days as, as a governor's homeland security advisor, so I actually do want a new one. <laughs> it's one of the main reasons I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thus ends the lightning round. Uh, we're going to move on, I think, to a question about DCF. So everyone's horrified about the loss of Jeremiah Oliver, uh, the five-year-old boy from Pittsburgh who is still missing and presumed dead. Some of you propose in response to change the structure of DCF. But the same problem happens in every state in the country. right? Un too few social workers, too little money, too many people with trouble. And every year, you hear the child gone missing or dead story, or some other horrible story. Is it even possible to fix the system as it is to protect children without fixing our starved mental health and addiction treatment systems, or without retraining parents who've grown up in violent family thems families themselves? Let's start with Juliet and move mm -hmm. around. That's uh, that's a hard question. So let me begin with DCF, because I, I think I, I disagree with the Attorney General on her proposal, not so much on the substance, but I think one of the challenges both for a campaign and if you're governor, all of us have taken over offices or, or been in charge of offices, is to be able to uh, sort of get outside of what's happening at that moment and look for systemic changes that last for the long time. So we all want a fix to DCF, but the problem is, is that the fix that we need? So the first thing you do when, some, when you lose a child, which Democrats and progressives should be more angry about because we believe in these programs, uh, is to, any, is any, anyone, any, any human, human being. being. But, but I mean, the, the fact we're on defensive about DCF, right? I mean, it gives people an opportunity to challenge the benefits of social services. So uh, you do a review almost immediately because, and that's what the governor has done, because you have to see how are you going to fix it for the long term. Now, it may be that it's a new, it's a division within the um, DCF. It may be that it's all the challenges that, that you face. But I mean, you know, you'll learn this about me on the campaign trail and as governor. It's just, uh, if you're going to fix something, fix it right for the long haul. And I don't think we know yet with DCF. I mean, you already raised four or five issues, right, that could be the, the issue. I mean, we want to do it right. I think it's about, first of all, governors, I think, have to be decisive whenever there's a crisis. And this was a crisis. And it continues to be a crisis. So it's about three things. Safety of every child. Accountability. Everybody should be accountable, from the commissioner down to the person who was hired yesterday. And finally, reform. And the re review is going to hopefully give us that kind of reform. But we don't know what that looks like yet. But there's a bigger issue here. If the number of children whom each social worker or caseworker is responsible for is more significant than the number they should reasonably expect to handle, then isn't that to some extent our problem, that we've cut the funding for DCF significantly since 2009 and laid too significant a burden on those caseworkers? I don't know the answer to that. I hope the review will demonstrate that. But this gets back to the fundamental issue. You judge a society by how we spend our resources. And if we're not spending enough to protect children, or we're not spending enough in other areas to bring children onto universal pre-K, then don't we have to look at our sources of funding and make a fundamental decision how we are going to fund and pay for those things? That, to me, is the most serious conversation we need to have. 
It's enough, not enough to say, well, let's just save money on health care and take all those savings and spend it on all the things that we want to do. That's not sufficient. You're not You've a got believer. To be more serious. Steve, you're not a believer. These I'm are a believer costs. that you can <laughs> save money, but I'm not a believer that a problem that is a crisis today can be solved by savings in health care tomorrow, next year, the year after. We've got to deal with it right now. And that's why I don't take revenue off the table. That's why it's got to be more progressive if we do it. Well, first, I mean, I, as a pediatrician and father, I just read these stories and my heart goes out to these people. I cannot imagine the pain and it, it's not okay. It's not acceptable. Um, I spent 30 years in executive. My, my commitment is to, is to excellence every single day. We need to, to, government needs to operate like the best possible business and I would never concede the defect. That's a matter of leadership, a matter of recruiting the energies and talents of the people who do it do the work and getting them the resources they need. And it's a matter of the kind of values we're talking about. Social justice, equality, and compassion is foundational to what we do. That's the answer. Our values link to sound leadership for excellence every day. You fix it by running an organization the way a, a great business runs with, with an empowered workforce that, whose ideas can be used with an executive who says, we're going to go for zero, zero defects. No one gets hurt. And I would never concede as governor to the harm of a single child. The minute we do that, we've lost the battle. So this is a tough topic for me because I've spent a lot of my time as an assistant, as chief of our child abuse unit, as an AG, worrying about the system, but also worrying about how every kid gets a fair shot at an education or safety in a home. You know, we handled over 900 cases of child abuse every single year in Middlesex County. Serious, physical, uh, sexual, and, and emotional abuse. Those are the cases that came to us as prosecutors. I know exactly what families go through. I've seen too many kids who have been hurt by caretakers where DCF or DSS then did a terrific job or a not so terrific job. And the one thing I bring to this discussion today is the experience I saw that of course we need more social workers who are better trained. I can tell you what that review will tell us. Everybody knows what that review will tell us. The one thing I bring to this discussion is my experience that says, if you have a 24-year-old social worker, no matter how much experience he or she has, and you send them into a home that's dysfunctional and say, your job is to try and keep this family together but keep the child safe, you are gonna have mistakes like we've had. And I've heard it for 25 years. I've heard it from DCF and DSS commissioners who've said we make two mistakes. We leave kids in and we take them out. We need to do better. And I believe that if you have a dedicated unit that will work to make sure for those kids where there's an identification of those serious kinds of cases that do go to DA's offices, that you will be able to keep track of them, you will be able to make sure they don't get lost, as Jeremiah Oliver did, which is heartbreaking, always heartbreaking. And you will be able to have a better decision as to when and if that child can go back to a family and be safe. And we have to realign those priorities in DCF. Well, <laughs> of course, it's an incredible tragedy. I'm a father, too, and just, the, uh, just imagining the loss of a child and having the state uh, in the state's care in this case, albeit indirectly, is, uh, you know, you can never uh, be preventive enough going forward. So I think we should take the review wherever it takes us, and that will probably show us, just as Martha's saying, you know, different caseloads and other kinds of processes. But I want to go back to what you really meant the question to be, which is the root causes uh, of uh, mental health and substance abuse too often plays into this. We're seeing the ramifications of that in many places. And uh, we have really underinvested in our mental health and substance abuse uh, systems in our Commonwealth, both on the private and the public side. And we took what was already an underinvested system and whittled it back during the recession. We now have to put back community programs for mental health and more for substance abuse. This is an investment we have to make. And when we do that, uh, we're at a breaking point right now. There are people being held over in emergency rooms for days because they don't know where to put them. There are uh, many people going without substance abuse treatment and ended up in the criminal justice system where they don't belong. And so there, and, and then we have the tragedy that we just talked about with uh, sometimes happening in foster care. So getting at the root cause means we have to own up to the idea that we need a more robust mental health community, mental health and substance abuse system. I actually have a health care plan coming out soon that will <coughs> definitely speak to that uh, robustly. I, I, just, I just need to add one thing. Um, Joe isn't from here on in banned from using the word plan. I'm sorry, it's been <laughs> <laughs> three strikes and you're out. Can I just say <laughs> something about this review? Uh, never underestimate government's capacity to learn. Because uh, there's, you know, I often say there's just no finish line. Like we're always going to do better. So uh, the idea that we know uh, what's going to happen, I mean, if this has been known for 20 years that this is a bad part of DCF, you know, this is the first time we're hearing about this division or that we should create a new bureaucracy, I just, 
you know, so, so to say that we know everything, right? And, and, and I've been critical of the governor, uh, you know, not doing a review of the Boston Marathon bombing, you know, an area that I know very well, that we can always learn, we can always share. So, so part of this is, what is the long-term fix for DCF? It may be more money, it may be better training, it may be all of the above. Uh, but, you know, part of our obligation to citizens who pay taxes to make these systems work is we're going to get better, too. Last thoughts before we move on? One mm -hmm. more thought. I want to build on Joe's point about um, substance abuse. Everywhere I go in the Commonwealth, this is a central concern people have. Substance abuse, mental health issues, and I would add suicide. I've set a goal of a 50% reduction in suicide and substance abuse over the dec next decade. I think we should do this, and I think anybody that's governor ought to be aiming in that direction. It's a burden that's just growing. We've got to stop it. You know, it seems to me leadership is about anticipating the future and acting on it. We are way too reactive in terms of these crises. If these crises happen regularly in other parts of the country, then why aren't we using our brain power and our ingenuity to anticipate that we're going to have the problem yeah. and fixing it before the problem exists? We can do a much better job of being leaders and anticipating those issues and investing wisely to make sure those problems don't occur but right how? here within Massachusetts. But how? Part of it is best learning from, from other no, no, Julia, you've had twice. Well, <laughs> I, I, I would use the phrase best practices. I mean, if you look at, just to use the issue that we were talking about earlier, which is universal pre-K, look at what Oklahoma did, look what Georgia did, and learn from them. If there are other states that have done a better job with their DCF, with far less uh, harm to those children, children dying, children missing, we've got these problems, we should look at other states. There have got to be other places that do a better job with their management of these issues than we do. We can't be the best in the country and still have lost so many children. Let's move on uh, to another economic development question. Uh, Facebook had its 10th anniversary this week. I have this lovely little video in my timeline, and we've heard a lot of nostalgic talk about how it started 10 years ago in a Harvard dorm. Uh, we all know what happened next. Why is Silicon Valley the center of the tech industry in this country? Why isn't it 128? What <laughs> went wrong? I'd love, to, Martha, I'd love to speak with that. Let's start with Martha Copeland first. Y you know, I think that we have always been um, a little more uh, conservative than California. We have more, uh, I always say Massachusetts has one foot in the 21st century and one in the 18th, mm -hmm. which California does not, or the 17th sometimes. Um, we have a lot of turf battles. We have a lot of regulation. We have a lot of things, including uh, if you look at uh, contracts, for instance, that prevent people from leaving and starting competitive distance that is different from California. So there's a lot of sort of cultural regulatory things that are different. I do think, however, though, that we are prepared to compete with California now with the kind of innovation technology we have with our institutions, and that does include teaching our kids to do something other than two tests, because that's where our future is. And Joe, I'm sorry, you wanted to check. Yeah, <coughs> there's a central lesson here. Um, the reason it's in California is because the software industry was nurtured in Northern California. It's, it's the pool of labor that's there, and it's not the innovators at the top. We have the innovators here in great spades. We, where we lose out is the middle skills, so the basic software engineers. And we haven't focused on that as a commonwealth, and that means our state and community colleges. That's where we, we there are 120,000 jobs right now not filled in Massachusetts because we don't have the right skill sets. That's the only way we're going to bring the tens of thousands of jobs based on new industries like software here to the commonwealth going forward. I've created thousands of jobs over 30 years uh, and run a global business right now where we work with university systems around the world that reach out to us, understand our work skills, and then we hire people into their company. I had to develop a program here at Salem State to do that very thing. Our state, going forward, needs to reach out and use this wonderful asset we've got, our state and community college system, in a much more aggressive way to develop the work skills for things like software, biotech manufacturing, biomedical manufacturing, uh, alternative energy, kinds of precision manufacturing. That's where the future is for us. We're missing it because we're not using our, uh, our, our asset that we've already got here much uh, more aggressively. And if we did that, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have missed the software revolution. And we have to do it now with the new industries. As the candidate who grew up in California, am I going to state the obvious? The weather also helps. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, let me. These be guys never go outside. Uh, Come know, on. I know. Uh, yeah, they still <laughs> held this today in the snow. But uh, uh, let me uh, be clear here about what business friendly means, because the other party has a way of sort of caricaturing our party as uh, not business friendly. Here's what business friendly is. It is uh, embracing people from all around the world who will be vital uh, contributors to our economic uh, and, our, and the future of mass 
Massachusetts. So it is someone who has been pushing and conti will continue to push for immigration reform on the federal level as well as being the most welcoming state. That, because these students are coming here and they are leaving, right? So the second, what else is business friendly? An infrastructure that works. I'm not joking about this. I keep coming back to it. You cannot convince uh, uh, companies to come here and invest uh, unless you can, you know, unless there's broadband in Western Mass, right? We're still discussing this. Finally, we should not try to compete with Facebook or Google. I mean, let's get their East Coast franchise. I mean, at Google, I was uh, talking to the head of Google here. They employ a thousand people. That's pretty great, right? So maybe we won't be the new Google, right? Maybe we won't create the next Google. But actually, being in partnership with California, being the viable uh, East Coast uh, satellite of these big companies, is is great for our economy. And because we will begin to f uh, focus on a workforce that can actually join this new this new tech industry. So having spent all my life here in Massachusetts, running a business for 35 years, creating jobs, I think the four key ingredients here are housing, internships, venture capital, and transportation. Lots of people leave Massachusetts because they can't afford to live here. We've got to create much more middle income housing. There are ways to do that. The state owns land. The T owns land. The Massport owns land. Make that land available to developers on an appropriate RFP and make that land available to reduce the cost of housing, that's going to keep more people here. Internships. We should have 5,000 summer internship, half paid for by the state, half by the business community, public-private partnership. They'll stay here if they have a summer internship and they fall in love with Massachusetts and a job in the technology sector. Venture capital. More of our venture capital needs to come here and stay here. We've got to be more creative, more innovative, more imaginative. We're losing money because people are not as risk-oriented as they need to be in California. Transportation, we've already talked about it, but if we can't get this transportation piece right, if we can't do the transportation reform that the governor has talked about, and he's been brilliant, and I support his transportation package pretty much down the line, we're not going to incentivize those young people to stay here and keep the T open till 3 a.m. Can I, can I go back to, I, I think, uh, let's, let's oh, let's go let ahead, Don, go first okay. and then Please. you can chime okay, back in. Then Joe. Um, <laughs> this is a great place to grow a business. I've done it. I started a nonprofit with a $250,000 grant that became a $40 million organization with a global spread, and it was wonderful to do that from this base with the assets we have here. We can continue to do that. We've done it in biotechnology. That's our Silicon Valley. We're now doing clean energy. 80,000 clean energy jobs in this state, 5,500 clean energy firms, 24% growth over the past two years. Sector by sector, we can be the engine of a lot of innovation. We really need to make that happen. Uh, we're right, uh, Joe's right about the education system. Investing in our community colleges is enormously important to match the workforce to the future. And the other, I might say, is international markets. For example, the relationships now between Israel and the Commonwealth are extraordinary. Money's flowing in here for investment, building jobs, building capital. We have to think entrepreneurially. We can beat California. So I just want to go back to the. This, oh, yeah. uh, I started, but I want to say. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, can no, I say one uh, quick thing, or I'll go. I'll go after Joe. Now this is the jump in round, so I just, <laughs> I just wanted to go back to uh, carry on with what Steve was saying. I, I think the central issue is really the work skills. I know that from running a business around the world, that we go where the work skills are, other companies go where the work skills are, other countries pay a lot more attention to their work skills to bring businesses there. As a state, we need to do that now. These companies can go way too many places in the world. It's, we're not just competing with Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And all the rest of the stuff that Steve talked about is good. But, and it's also good for small business, but Steve's run a small business. I've run very large organizations. Uh, what he's doing for small business is good, but what we need is what will bring new industries here. It's not, all, it's not, it's not really uh, comparable, and I think the experience is very different. Having global experience, competing in the world today is what we need for Massachusetts tomorrow. All right, then. So I was campaigning in Newton not too long ago, and I met a young couple with their grandparents, and I said, oh, where are you from? They said, we just moved back to Newton from California because I got a better job here and we wanted a better school for our son. And so, you know, those are the strengths that bring people here. We can do that in Massachusetts. But governors have to be bold, okay? Deval Patrick was told we're going to have a 10-year recession, governor, hunker down. And he said, no, I'm going to invest. I'm an optimist. A billion dollars in the life sciences, and Don's right. 56,000 people, they average $120,000. Same thing with the clean energy industry. And Don's right about the numbers. And those numbers will create another 75,000 jobs over the next seven or eight years. So we're doing some of the right things, but it does take a governor to be bold and decisive and to understand what moves companies and moves money and moves capital and to have that capital stay right here. 
Thank you all. We have time for one last relatively quick question. So um, I want to give you guys a chance to sum things up a little bit. E each one of you is sort of known coming into this race for one area of expertise, uh, healthcare, uh, business, law enforcement, homeland, or, or security writ large. Uh, I want you each to name your most visionary idea outside your known area of expertise. And 25 words or less. <laughs> if you can. <laughs> we have a little bell here. We'll ring it. For me, it's about values. We need Massachusetts to be a beacon of progressive values. And if I'm governor, I want to reassert words like social justice and compassion and equality and the kind of things that made America great. This vocabulary has been muted in this country. In this state, it must not be muted. We must be the place that's talking about the values upon which a fair and just society rests and n never, ever apologize for that. The people of Massachusetts are ready for it, and the country needs us to go there. So my uh, idea is that right now we are in a position where we could and should spend a lot more on uh, mental health and on education and on rehabilitation than on incarceration. Uh, and I uh, lived with a young brother who suffered from bipolar and depression. Uh, at age 33, he committed suicide after my parents died. We went through that alone and that experience, as well as my experience in the criminal justice system, says we need to invest in making sure everybody has access to good mental health care. That means in kindergarten, it means in third grade, it means for 17-year-olds, it means for our vets, uh, and it means that we need to realign our priorities here in Massachusetts to reduce stigma and give people the help they need around mental and behavioral health. So I'm known for controlling health care costs and creating thousands of jobs, but what I'm not known for and what I will push also for is uh, carbon tax. I believe uh, climate change is real. I believe in the very aggressive things we are doing, and not only our aggressive caps uh, for the region and also the alternative energy, but I will push for a carbon tax as long as we can make it revenue neutral, uh, and there are ways to do that. I think British Columbia has had a great experience over five years where they've shown that if you um, price uh, carbon and, and therefore the heavy users of fossil fuels uh, pay heart more for it, uh, then, uh, then, they, then you will um, be able to lower emissions, and it can be done but without harming the economy as British Columbia has shown. So I am known uh, mostly in the homeland security space, although I started my career as a civil rights attorney, and, uh, and in complex and crisis management, making government work to get the pieces together when communities uh, need it. Uh, uh, what I am not known for, which I will push, is uh, something sort of unrelated to that a little bit, is on criminal justice reform. I am out there uh, because, uh, you know, I have spent a world in which I know what bad is, right? And I have uh, traveled the world knowing that and experiencing and helping communities that have suffered from it. Uh, and, and this is an issue that just Massachusetts can't sit on the sidelines anymore. If you look at the numbers, if you look at what we're doing to our children, it is something we cannot uh, just pass on. Uh, we've lost generations of kids, and we need to get serious about it, and I think I am a Democrat who hasn't been part of the system, but someone who can uh, talk seriously about, yes, there is bad. I agree with that, but I'm not soft on anything, uh, and certainly not this. So I will begin to push that. So I think I'm known as somebody who, in business, in politics, in the nonprofit world, and in as state treasurer, has been in the solutions business. When I make a promise, I keep it. Every promise I made when I ran as treasurer, I kept those promises. And so the most important thing I think about is inclusion. We leave too many people out. We leave too many people behind. We have a million people born in Massachusetts who weren't born in Massachusetts. To the extent that we can come up with a plan to create jobs and economic opportunity and leave uh, no one out, make sure those gateway communities that are doing poorly but need an investment, and I'll be a governor who will invest in that manner, in those men and women, in those families, to make sure that economic opportunity is shared by everybody, broadly, across the entire breadth of this Commonwealth. Okay, now the critical question for Democratic primary voters, and you get three words. Three words. How will you beat Charlie Baker? <laughs> Can I? <laughs> <laughs> I have an entire staff working on this now. No. <laughs> All right, you got yours. That no, was no, staff no, effort. No, 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 <laughs> okay. no, no. That right, was a Don, duo Martha, where you go ahead. Casual. Working every day. All right. Jobs, health care, education. Uh, nothing for granted. Jobs, economic opportunity. Grassroots mobilization. Everybody wants it. All right. You guys did it. Thank you so much. That concludes our gubernatorial debate. Tune in for future ones. Um, thank you for following Boston.com. Thanks to all of our candidates and to EJ.
Thank you for the chance, and I hope you all win.